Hey everybody, this is Ian O'Byrne again. This is October 14th, uh, 2017. Taking a look at some of the stuff that I did this uh, week and then also the things that I shared out in this week's newsletter, which is number 119. Um, 119, basically uh, a couple of good things that happened this week and a lot of like interesting threads that I've seen throughout some of this work um, and some of the materials that I shared. One, I shared out this post that I had on uh, using constraints and limitations in our thinking and in our work uh, as a way to sort of foster uh, creativity and foster divergent thinking. Um, at the this ties into a lot of my other stuff that I've been writing about in terms of divergent versus convergent thinking and stop motion animation and stuff like that. Um, and one of the interesting things that I've been trying to think through, and this is something that I sort of flesh out in this post is stuff that my colleague uh, Nenad Radakovich uh, was talking about in terms of how we think about creativity and our and our uh, use of creativity in our work sort of expands if we put limitations on our work. So what I do is I basically talk about um, down at the bottom some possible ways to constrain or limit yourself or limit the work of your students to provide opportunities to have to foster divergent thinking and also creativity. So I share a bunch of this and it's been helping me get my ideas on paper and sort of flesh these ideas out. And there's a, a series of posts. I'm trying to a weave a narrative about my thinking about this. Um, and a lot of this relates to some of the research that we're doing. This week, uh, we went to the SKATE conference, the South Carolina Association of, Association of Teacher Educators uh, conference at Coastal Carolina. Um, I presented with Nenid and with Tracy Hunter Doniger on some of the research that we conducted with students in our program. And this is work that we, uh, we analyzed and we wrote up the research and sent it out for uh, a publication with uh, two undergrads and a graduate student. We ultimately wanted them to come present with us, but then things got in the way and they weren't able to attend the conference with us. I really wish that they would have, um, but we basically had two sessions at Skate. The first session was focused on stop motion animation, and we worked through the process that we used in the research with our teachers. The second session was all about conducting research with undergrad and graduate level students, specifically pre-service teachers in our instance. And so we wanted to basically show like two sides of the coin. One, what was the work that we did with stop motion animation? And then two, sort of what did we learn from the research with our students? And then what did we learn about like ourselves and our students in our field based upon our research with the students? So um, this link is out to the original publication with the stop motion animation and it has the manuscript that we sent out for publication um, and then these two slide decks are from each of the different sessions i also put together a video on my use of google forms to guide students and create student constructed quizzes um, using google forms it's something that i do regularly in class and i sent out one this week to sort of I sent out one this week to my students. I wanted to put together a video that basically outlines the strategies and how I do that. In terms of the, the video that I focused on this week, this is a, a series that I, I it just came out um, and I've been checking it out. It, it's, it's called In Real Life and it takes a lot of uh, some of the hateful or bullying messages that we see online and it reenacts them in a public setting. Uh, and my guess is that they hire actors to go out and sort of like reenact these um, statements that people make and see what other people do and what is their response to this. And this is the, you see this a lot on like TV newscasts where they'll they'll reenact something and, you know, people behaving badly out in public. And then they have video cameras, hidden cameras there to see what is the reaction from people in the room. And they try to see like what is the response, what do people do? Um, and then they ask the individuals nearby, like, why didn't you do anything? Why didn't you step in and like, you know, protect this person when they were getting like yelled at or trolled or bullied? Um, so it's, it's interesting to have this. I think there's good opportunities to use it in educational settings. We can have students watch it and have, uh, you know, spark good discussion and dialogue about why we get involved or don't get involved. 
And one of the first pieces that I shared in the read section is a piece by Nick Carr in the Washington Post, I believe, uh, the Wall Street Journal talking about smartphones and how they hijack our minds. Um, and it's something really to think about because, you know, we frequently see this debate about is Google making us dumber? Like, do we not really have to pay attention to facts or learn facts because we can just Google it? Um, I don't, and, and that we have like shallow thinking and Nick Carr definitely made a, a, a lot of, uh, you know, he published a book, I believe, on shallow thinking and how Google is making us think less deeply. Um, and I don't really agree with that sentiment, but with the smartphones piece, I'm wondering if there's real value to that, if there's real weight to that. Um, I'm thinking about my own use of the devices and, and I walk around campus and I see students and individuals that are just staring at their devices and not really looking at where they're walking. I'm thinking about always paying attention to the notifications that pop up on my phone and just grab my attention from what I'm doing. Um, and I'm wondering if there's real merit in this and if we need to pay attention to the ways in which we're possibly addicted to these devices. Um, and I didn't think that I was going to feel that way or, or have that thought process, but I'm beginning to, I've always looked at my own processes and habits with this, um, and I'm starting to pay attention more to what I do and what other individuals do. Um, there was a, at the beginning of this week, there was a lot of information that came out about, um, you know, when we, we, uh, how, do, how do I want to say this? Um, you know, there's following the U.S. presidential election, there's been a lot of news coming up about media literacy, our critical evaluation of online information, and then also how these digital texts and tools and spaces and online social networks possibly paid a, played a role in this in spreading information, disinformation, um, and propaganda and some outright lies about a lot of different elements, a lot of different factors. Um, and, and, you know, and it's how did that basically mold public opinion and sway votes and stuff like that. So one of the interesting things is that there was two pieces that came out, one by the BBC, this one, and then I shared down below the other piece on, the, on CBS News. And what was interesting is I talked to some of the people behind the scenes that sort of like ran the Facebook side of things. And initially, my thinking was that it was this very clandestine, you know, they, they were very secretive about what they did. Um, but it seems like it's pretty straightforward. Like, the social networks collect a lot of data on this. We knew what would happen. We knew they were collecting data on us. Um, we don't entirely know how effective it is because they um, play fast and loose with privacy, um, you know, Twitter and especially Facebook uh, and Google, they don't really let us know what information they have about us. We know that these organizations are selling off our data and these algorithms and these breadcrumbs that we leave behind to get better pictures of us. And in many instances, and we've talked about this in TLDR, in many instances, a lot of these social networks and feeds know more about us than we know about ourselves. So there's all of this information out there. And you know, some of us would have a problem with the fact that, you know, advertisers can pay and, and a, you know, a soft drink company or a soap company or a technology company can buy this information and target advertising directly to me based upon these breadcrumbs that I leave behind. So we know all that. But what happens when like political parties or people that really want to advertise to you instead of throwing ads up on TV, what if they pay to target specific people? Is that ethical? Um, and a lot of these dark ads. So, you know, the, it, the video, especially this one on BBC, really, really fascinating. Um, just looking at the way that they are, you know, skillfully and it's, and it's very interesting, just to be totally honest, it's very interesting how they sort of set that up. So I definitely recommend clicking through and watching the video. Um, this piece was the uh, founder of uh, eBay came in and talked about the ways in which these social networks are really a threat to democratic ideals and explains why and how. Really thoughtful piece, definitely recommend reading it. And this week at the same time, Facebook and Twitter announced that they basically deleted a bunch of content. Um, and so, you know, Facebook especially, first Zuckerberg came out and said, oh, well, 
you know, Facebook had no role in any of this, and I share the link there. Facebook isn't at fault. And then not soon after, you know, a couple of days or a week after that, a lot of the backlash said, no, you definitely played a role in this. Um, you know, and we see the U.S. government, you know, requesting documents and requesting to learn more about this. So there were, there were researchers and scholars out there studying these materials. And, uh, you know, they had not only access to a lot of the social content, but then they had machines and tools that would go in and scrape this information out and analyze it a bit and provide it in a, in a way that's a little bit easier to make sense of. And Facebook and Twitter basically went in and deleted content. And at the same time, they sort of cut off the valve to these researchers. Um, so, I mean, on one level, I think this is reprehensible. Uh, I think that the internet as, is the dominant text of our generation. I think that this is content that even though it's online, I think these are public spaces. These are open domain. This is public conversation. Yes, it's their property, I guess. It's on their sites and on their servers. Um, but I think we need to have a long, hard look about what happens with this content as we share it online. You know, who owns it? Um, and once it's out there, should it stay out there? Regardless of uh, what I think is happening is I think Facebook and Twitter are trying to cover their tracks. I think they try to soft pedal um, their uh, how complicit they are in this. Um, and then what was their role and what role should they have in sort of shutting down this sort of stuff in the future? Or should they shut it down in the future? But I think that these are this is discussion that we need to have and, and talk about what does this really mean? A uh, really interesting piece about uh, the algorithms and the logic and the philosophy that goes into a lot of autonomous uh, autonomous vehicles. We've seen these stories pop up over the last year or two as we see, you know, driverless cars. And, you know, Mercedes basically came out in this post in Read Write was really fascinating. They came out and said, you know what, we are going to, our car will, will if it's a decision between protecting the occupants of our car or the pedestrians we're going to focus on protecting the occupants and so i read it and i knew that this was coming but i looked at it and I said here is a real world situation a real world reason why we need to have more discussion about logic and philosophy and coding and algorithmic thinking in our classrooms um you know and and this is the type of world that we're going going into um or actually we're already in and we need to prepare our future individuals for those contexts. At the same time, um, you know, as, as I was going back and forth with some colleagues and friends on social networks about this, it was one of the things I was thinking is, you know, this is a selling point or, or when will this be a selling point to people when they buy a car? It's like, well, you know, our code, our our algorithms that make our autonomous, you know, our autonomous driver, our autonomous vehicle go um, are the highest quality. And we will definitely protect you as opposed to others. So when will we start to view that as a as a feature that your your code and, and your autonomy and your vehicle is more sophisticated than other cars? So we look at like engine size and size of the car and everything else. When does that become a feature if it's not already? Um, and then also, as I said, this is definitely a reason to buy a Mercedes if you don't already, or if you don't, just make sure that you don't live next to somebody that does have a Mercedes. Um, in my own life, I've talked a little bit about my use of meditation and, and mindfulness activities. Um, it helps me sort of like clear my mind and try to reset each day um, and sort of control my emotions and, and stay focused and not get like overwhelmed, uh, you know, throughout the day and across different days. And so I've noticed a lot of those same patterns and habits in my son. And so I've been trying to say, you know, when you're in class and someone bullies you or you feel scared, you know, or whatever's happening, there's a chance to like just stop and breathe and collect your emotions and move forward. And I'm trying to build that habit and skill set up in my son, but it's hard at times. Um, it's taken me a long time to figure out how to meditate and be mindful and breathe and i'm still not good at it at all um, and so it's hard to say to a seven-year-old 
the, you know, this is how you breathe. So this post from Life Hacker was really interesting talking about like breathing buddies. Um, and so I, I like some of the ideas and it might be like a scaffold to get in there and think more about what this means and how to do it. Really enjoy the Binging with Babish channel on YouTube. Um, and what I, what I like about this is I saw that, you know, he's launching this new website called Basics with Babish and he has the book that just came out. Um, and even though I just shared all the links to his content and I'm in, his, in essence promoting all of his stuff, um, on one level, really intrigued by the way that he has created these spaces. Um, I'm thinking that it, what he's probably going to do, I don't know. I haven't spent more time digging in. I'm thinking that he's going to have like classes in the basics with Babish section that would tie into a bolt, a book and his YouTube videos and just being blunt. Like I'm really interested in the way he structures all that. And I'm going to use that as a guide as I try and build up, um, current and future content, really interested in the, the, the intersection and the, in the infrastructure that he's setting up there. And the second reason is I like to cook. I believe in cooking. Um, I believe in buying the right tools for your kitchen and not wasting money on other things. Um, and so he has a first episode and links are in here about what do you need to buy? Like what's the real non-negotiable? You need this type of knife. You need these type of pots and pans. Like what do you need as opposed to when you go to like the kitchen stores and you feel overwhelmed, you don't need all that stuff. There's only certain things that you definitely need to get started. To pull this all together, I really like this quote, uh, the key to success is action and the S and the essential in action is perseverance. Um, several things that are, I'm involved in right now and trying to do, um, and I'm just trying to remind myself, I'm trying to remind you, you know, dear reader and dear listener as well, but remind myself about like, what do we need to stay focused on? What's the important stuff here? Um, and I have more to come about this. Uh, so once again, that's, uh, Issue number 119 in Too Long Didn't Read. Um, by all means, if you haven't subscribed already, you can at my website at wioburn.com. Um, you can subscribe by clicking up here to the newsletter right there, or you can go and enter your email address there. But all of my other content is there. You can go to the blog and check everything else out. Um, but by all means, go in and take a peek. If any of this stuff helps you out, let me know. Uh, and once again, this is October 14th, 2017. Thanks a lot for paying attention and have a great week.